Welcome to Much More on Medicine. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Are you under a stay-at-home order because of COVID-19 like I am? I'm actually not in the studio today because I'm making sure that I am not around potentially contagious people. Um, and like many of you, uh, you may be maybe experiencing boredom, loneliness, or other psychological challenges because you're at home. So stay tuned to learn about owning your life during the COVID-19 pandemic, staying in control in an out-of-control world. Much More on Medicine is an opportunity to learn about all aspects of healthcare. I talk with guests about medical and alternative care treatment, insurance, medication, surgery, rehabilitation, prevention, and much more. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Ron Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser is a positive health psychologist and director of psychology at the Jefferson Headache Center at Thomas Jefferson University. His interest in wellness promotion has led to the development of goal-achieving psychology and the type P personality. He has a significant online presence devoted to helping people live in more healthy and positive ways through platforms such as his website, the Mental Health Gym, and his podcast, Rejuvenating with Dr. Ron Kaiser. His book, Rejuvenating, The Art and Science of Growing Older with Enthusiasm, has won awards, and he is a keynote and TEDx speaker. Welcome, Dr. Kaiser. Nice to be with you, Catherine. Well, I have a lot of questions for you today. Um, are you also under an order to stay at home? Yes, uh, for a couple of reasons. Although I do work in a medical center, uh, they have kind of restricted those of us who are in the upper age ranges and told us to stay home. But the Philadelphia area generally is, is under about as much of a quarantine as, as there is in most places with supermarkets and uh, pharmacies and gas stations open, but uh, I don't know when I'm going to get another haircut or when I'm going to get my shirts out of the dry cleaners. Uh, absolutely. Well, as an attorney, I am an exempt business. However, I'm not sure how long um, that will um, be allowed. Um, but this is a really unique situation, and from a psychological psychological um, perspective, what makes it so unique? There's several things that really make it unique. First of all, in most cases, whenever we have a, a crisis, it tends to be a, a temporary thing, one that, okay, we prepare for the storm or the tornado uh, or the inclement weather of some type, and at some point it passes. Uh, our history with other medical issues, such as as the regular flu is you go about your business normally, you try and take care of yourself, get the flu shot, uh, but basically things don't shut down. Uh, with this, there's so much unknown about it and it has impacted on uh, so many aspects of our lives. People have lost their jobs, uh, people have lost money, uh, at least on paper in, in the stock market, and also there's a lot of ambiguity about when is this thing going to end? When can we get out? So in addition to the fact that we're just not used to uh, being quarantined for an extended period of time, there's just so much uncertainty which allows the mind to do all kinds of uh, strange things with our thinking. We're, we're being bombarded with bad news. And I have to admit that I'm constantly watching the news and trying to find out more information about what might happen. But what, do you have any recommendation as to whether we should continue watching the news and paying attention to what's going on? I encourage people to watch the news the way that they're supposed to check emails. Unless it's an ongoing component of your job, it's always recommended that, hey, maybe you check it in the morning, check it uh, sometime in the noon hour or thereabouts, early afternoon, and check it again later uh, in the
in the day. I think it's the same kind of thing here. It's a fast moving situation, but it doesn't move from quarter hour to quarter hour. And, you know, nothing particularly good yet is coming out of the news. So why punish ourselves? You know, we can check in another three or four hours and see what's happening. So I, I think there are much more proactive things that you can do than kind of passively accept you know, what you hear on the news and then spend time worrying about it. Okay, that makes a whole lot of sense. And do you have a, an opinion or thought as to what our mindset should be at about this, at this time? Yes, I like to think in terms of what I call the proactive and positive mindset. Proactive meaning to focus on what things we can do to control whatever we can control. There are lots of things that we can't control. And again, there's a lot of ambiguity. We don't know how, no matter how careful we are, whether we've been exposed. Uh, but, you know, we want to be proactive. There are things that we can do. And also, the positive mindset. Uh, the first book that I ever wrote was in 2011, uh, the first popular book at any rate, called What Can Go Right? Uh, and I think that's something we've got to at least give some credence to. Uh, there's not a guarantee that everything's going to go right, and probably uh, there are many things that will go wrong, but we have to at least allow ourselves the recognition that things will go right. Uh, most prominently, the fact that this will end at some point, and we want to be able, through our proactivity and through our mindset, to be able to prepare for that time. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And I know that you're a, a proponent of positive, positive psychology, as you just indicated. Does this philosophy be help you prepare and help us prepare for this situation? Yes, I think it's an important component of the situation. Again, positive psychology really looks at getting people to thrive. How can we flourish? Uh, what things can we do to move forward? As opposed to looking at uh, disease and trying to get us out of the disease, but actually what things can we do to flourish? And I think that's a really important thing. I have, uh, for my patients and followers, I've come up with kind of a concept that I call uh, great um, SOS, uh, you know, it, it lists some of the things that people can keep in mind in order to be able to take charge of as much of their lives as they can. Again, we're not trying to be stupid about it. We're not trying to say that there aren't some real dangers and some people will uh, have a difficult time with this from a physical standpoint. But as long as we can be in charge of owning a big part of our life, let's try and implement some of those steps. Well, when I was recently in Minneapolis, I was watching the news. And at that point, they were under a stay-at-home order. And many people were at home working. And in a lot of situations, couples were at home working in closed Quarters. And they recommended that they that as these couples or families have to work in those situations, um, that they create a fictitious coworker that they can blame things on. And I would look at that as a specific strategy. Can you recommend other strategies for people that are confined to their homes? Yes, I think I can recommend some better ones. Uh, First of all, I do have to say, uh, I hope you found Minneapolis to be a, a really nice place. That's where I grew up and spent the first 22 years of my life. So it's, uh, I have fond memories of it. Uh, but I do think that there are uh, some things that, because of technology, that we're able to do uh, now that, that we can't uh, or couldn't at some point. First of all, I encourage people uh, to, when, when I speak with company executives and others, to 
create staff meetings, whether you need it or not. I do it with my own staff and over Zoom or other kinds of uh, ways of, of relating to just be able to be in touch with the other. I encourage people to email pictures of themselves if they're co-workers so that you do have co-workers around you. I also encourage people to kind of start thinking in terms of their pets or children as being co-workers, to build in specific times that they can look forward to being with them. I also do have to point out that if, uh, I, I know this is untested ground for a lot of people, but if uh, someone and their spouse is having a lot of trouble spending time together, I think that's indicative of perhaps another problem that they may want to discuss when this thing is over. Uh, you know, it's interesting that you talked about pets as coworkers. I posted um, on Facebook, um, what are your pet coworkers doing right now? And that was probably the most popular post. And it seems that so many people posted uh, pictures of their cats and dogs and had something funny about what they were doing. And uh, they and we call them our coworkers. And so lately, I've just been calling my Siamese cats my coworkers. Yes, she should be part of your job if you if you're home because she is in essence a coworker. And I would definitely make sure that you're building in time, uh, you know, snuggling time or whatever, uh, play time, so on, because this is this is a part of your life for the near term. And I did a webinar this morning, and it was kind of interesting. I actually did it from home, and my uh, one of my cats actually got on the back of the chair that I was on and was in the screen, and there was like hundreds of people watching this. It was kind of amusing uh, because I guess my coworker wants to be part of part of uh, the show. Yeah, it's a little bit like there was a famous picture of. Uh, of person, uh, a professor, I believe he was in the UK, who was giving a real serious talk with uh, his coat and tie on from his home, and pretty soon his kids started coming into the picture. So uh, it looks like that was a very similar thing in your situation. Yeah, um, I actually, I think I saw that. But um, at this time, we're going to take a short break. I'm Catherine Moore. This is Much More on Medicine on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. We're talking with Dr. Ron Kaiser about owning your life during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Rusty Kamori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. I feature a wide range of amazing guests who share valuable insights about how going beyond the lines leads to success in everything you do in life. I'm looking forward to you joining me every Monday at 11 a.m. Aloha. We're back, we're live. I'm Catherine Noor, and this is Much More on Medicine on the ThinkTech Live Streaming Network series. And we're talking with Dr. Ron Kaiser about owning your life during the COVID-19 pandemic. Doctor, how important is interacting with others during this time? Oh, tremendously important. Uh, it's really a major part of the, the human condition to be social. Uh, we are learning more and more about this all the time. There's a good deal of research that enabled us to, to really state this with a great deal of certainty. We know, for example, that loneliness 
is right up there as a killer along with smoking, obesity, uh, sedentary lifestyle when people get to be uh, in their senior years. And if for many people, whether it was work, whether it was a particular uh, restaurant they stopped at, the store, the neighborhood, for many people that was a major part of their social life. So automatically, they got feedback on a regular basis, got a certain amount of psychological support, also got a certain amount of uh, maybe some negative uh, references so they could know what kinds of changes to make and so on. Um, now suddenly, people in many cases are confined to their homes. They're not feeling good about the situation. They're not feeling up to call somebody uh, but it's a really necessary thing. For one thing, the more you avoid it, it's like any other muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. It's, if you haven't called somebody for 10 days, it's a lot easier to not call them the 11th day. And then that multiplies, it lessens the human interaction. The other thing is that other people need to hear from you. It's important for everybody's self-image to touch base with others, to have that feeling that we are a community, even though we're experiencing this, this unusual kind of situation. And technology makes it so much easier now than ever before between phone, texting, uh, FaceTime, Zoom, lots of different ways to be able to do this, uh, that it's it's a very powerful and important thing that we can't really neglect. And the big problem in relation to it is there's nobody's going to make you do it unless you take the initiative and do so. You know, you may have a particularly close friend or family member who's feeling more positive and, and reaches out to others on a regular basis. But you have to assume that that's part of your job. Right now, maintaining ownership of your life is your job. That makes sense. Um, you know, on my, in my own situation, I was most disappointed that I couldn't go to Zumba five nights a week like I normally do. And fortunately, I have two things that are working in my favor. My friends that I, that I do Zumba with, we are all texting each other a lot during the day. And then they have a few instructors that are doing live, stream, live streaming of workouts in the evenings, and we're able to do it on our own. And then we kind of you know, weigh in, we put comments um, on their site, and we actually text each other about it. Uh, to confirm that we did it and we had fun, that kind of thing, and post pictures. Um, so I, that's been a, a wonderful situation. Yes, there's lots of things like Zumba, uh, yoga, meditation, uh, lots of available ways of feeling in charge of normalizing your life that are available online nowadays. And also, I don't know how it is in, in your situation, uh, we are permitted to go outside uh, as long as we keep social distance. And I live across the street from uh, one of the major parks in the city. And I do see on a regular basis three or four people take their yoga mats, space them far uh, far enough apart, and do practice that outside. Again, I, from a health standpoint, if you can go outside and maintain social distance, that's an important thing. But again, let's not forget all these opportunities that we have, if you have a computer, to be able to stay healthy while staying involved. In Hawaii, our parks are closed. However, we are allowed to go walking or running or Actually, the governor said that we can go surfing or swimming in the ocean. However, they've closed the parks, but I understand that we are able to walk through those closed areas to the ocean. However, I think it's complicated, but I, I 
I think what they're trying to encourage us to keep fit and to walk outside and do things outside to make us healthy. However, they're trying to discourage us from congregating. Yes, it's somewhat similar here. I think you've got the advantage that you don't get as, at least at this time of the year, you don't get as many bad weather days. Today we uh, had a lot of rain in Philadelphia, and my best uh, attempt at walking kind of got rained out. Absolutely. Now, I, I think a lot of people wonder about this one question, and and I, I certainly do. I, I do use Facebook a lot, and I do appreciate that ability to communicate with people. However, as you probably know, social media has its good and its bad, and there are people that are very negative on social media and that that, um, you know, they judge people that post certain things. Um, do you have any philosophy on how to approach social media so that you can use it in a really positive way and avoid the negative? Two things. Number one, I always have preached that you don't have to be involved with toxic people. If you, you know, if you set goals uh, or uh, limits as to who you're going to be involved with and be able to say, you know, I don't prefer to deal with negative people. Um, I, I'm sure a crisis like this brings out some negative stuff in people who may not have shown that before. So that's one thing. The other is I think we each have to be a role model. I, I think if you're a role model of positive proactive behavior, let people learn from you, and if it's not rewarding to them to be able to uh, continue to express negative stuff because you aren't involved with them, uh, and they're seeing your comments being liked, hopefully that'll make the world a little bit better uh, a place, uh, one person at a time. But it is, you know, it is an issue as much as possible. I think you try and control, again, what you can control by avoiding certain people and by posting positive and uplifting things on your own. When I post, I try very hard to post funny things, um, cats and dogs, um, Anything that I think is funny and cute and fun, and I try hard not to post things that are kind of a downer, but on occasionally occasion, I might post something that's a little serious, but I think having kind of that, that um, those standards, I think it's kind of helpful. Yeah, I think it's the same thing as, as friendships outside of social media. You know, you don't you don't want to avoid the fact that there's a real world out there and sometimes you have to comment about it, but probably your strongest friendships are with people who make you feel good, not either tear you or other people down. Sure. And, you know, I, I know that a lot of people may experience depression and anxiety at this time. Um, what do they do if they don't already have a therapist? For one thing, uh, there are uh, many restrictions. Most states have dropped restrictions with respect to doing teletherapy. So the fact that they don't have one doesn't necessarily mean they can't get one. It's not ideal, certainly, to not have met in person first, but there is a lot of teletherapy being done. But I think let's look at what depression and anxiety is. Anxiety is predicting that something is going to go wrong before it actually has, kind of predicting failure before it's happened, and then acting as if that's what is going to happen. And that's where I think asking what can go right is an important thing. Be able to interrupt that negative thinking and ask what can go right. With respect to depression, the cognitive components really is the expectation that things will never get better uh, or that 
I'm this special kind of person that lousy things happen to me. And if you get your head into that kind of a cycle, that becomes very important uh, in terms of maintaining that cycle. So the, the obvious thing is to break that cycle. You begin to question, how do I know? Am I a fortune teller? One of the questions I often have my patients ask themselves, am I a fortune teller? You know, what can go right? How is this helping me get to where I want to get to? And I encourage people to have four or five questions in advance that they can ask themselves to kind of guard against depression. Uh, but I do think you also have to take into uh, account the fact that sometimes you may have to reach out professionally to a therapist or to someone who prescribes medication to deal with those things. But for most people, if this is a new and relatively, hopefully, temporary situation, a lot can be done in terms of what you tell yourself. And we will have an end to this at some point. Do you have any thoughts about the aftermath? Yes, I think that there are things that we can learn. We wouldn't want to make this the way that we learn, but that we can learn to, that will enable us to be better people. For example, we can use some of the time in very productive ways to learn new skills, to take a course over the computer or to read uh, things of this nature, to organize our desk so that and our uh, cupboards, drawers, so on to make sure that we've got a system in place that we can continue using. Uh, we can learn more uh, self-management kinds of things, meditation, uh, self-compassion, being as good to ourselves as we're often to other people. Uh, even the, the, the basic things, to notice that it's important to wash our hands and not touch our face if we've been uh, exposed to, to dirty areas. So I think there are things that we should look at as not only uh, what we're going through right now, but as building blocks for the future. Then I think the other element is to begin to see this as a way of building resilience. We're going through something. Hopefully, we're all going to make it. This is part of our history. We got through this. You know, it was something that we didn't want, but we did the right things to get us to the other side. Fantastic, Doctor. You've very helped a lot of people today, but we're out of time and we'll have to wrap it up. I'm Catherine Nora. This is Much More on Medicine on the ThinkTech Live Streaming Network Series. We've been talking with Dr. Ron Kaiser about owning your life during the COVID-19 pandemic, staying in control in an out-of-control world. Thank you for joining us today. Next week, my guest will be attorney Natalie Pettit, we will be talking about COVID-19 legal issues. Thanks to our broadcast engineer and to Jay Fidel, our executive producer. Please join us for future ThinkTech productions.